So thank you for joining the webinar to learn about the Planning for Hazards Land Use Solutions for Colorado guide and website. My name is Ann Miller, and I work as a senior planner with the Colorado Department of Local Affairs in the Division of Local Government's Community Development Office. I'm joined with Tarek Lafay from Clarion Associates. In addition, Andy Rumbach, an assistant professor in the Department of Planning and Design at the University of Colorado, Denver, will facilitate the question and answer portion of the webinar at the end of the presentation. In the wake of the 2012-13 federally declared fires and floods that hit many Colorado communities hard, there was a sense of urgency to rebuild, but also a desire to fully integrate hazards into land use planning to reduce risk over the long term. This Planning for Hazards guide was developed to help disaster impacted communities and really all Colorado communities and beyond to proactively plan to avoid the devastation caused by disasters. Clearing Associates was hired with a Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Planning Grant to develop the guide with input from an advisory council made up of local, state, and federal government representatives and other experts in the field. First, we will lay the foundation for the importance of and approaches to integrating hazards into land use planning. Then we'll provide an overview of the Planning for Hazards guide and website, including highlighting some of Colorado case studies. Finally, we will look forward to how local governments can take action to implement the best practices in this guide. Colorado's population is projected to grow over 50% between 2010 and 2040, to so close to 8 million. How we grow will shape the long-term economic, social, and environmental health and viability of Colorado and its communities. Like many states across the nation and the globe, we are no stranger to hazards. The 2013 floods alone resulted in 10 lives lost, 1,800 homes destroyed, and close to $4 billion in damages. And the recent disasters are not isolated cases. The 1965 Front Range floods and the 1976 Big Thompson flood are devastating reminders that we must proactively plan to avoid this level of de destruction. As local government staff and leaders, it is your job to plan for a myriad of hazards, from floods and fires to landslides, drought, and even hazardous material accidents. The Colorado Resiliency Framework was adopted by the governor in 2015 and provides a foundation for our collective work to ensure a healthy and resilient future. Shaped by input from community voices and state leadership, the plan puts forward a vision and concrete strategies, including this Planning for Hazards Guide. Colorado communities are taking action and three countywide resiliency framework plans have already been developed in Larimer, Boulder, and El Paso counties. We encourage you to learn more about the resili resiliency framework efforts by visiting coloradounited.com. Learning from past disasters and avoiding and reducing future risk is key to our safety and livelihood. Creating a resilient Colorado means adapting to and even thriving amidst changing conditions and challenges to maintain the quality of life balancing economic vitality and conservation of resources. Not just bouncing back, but building back stronger from shocks and stressors, from economic downturns to natural disasters is important. There are many approaches to integrating hazards into land use planning. Of course, the most effective way to protect development from hazards is to prohibit development in known hazard areas. But in many historic and built-out Colorado communities, we know this is not always possible. This guide provides land use strategies for preventing development in hazardous areas through, for example, land acquisition or preservation programs in high hazard areas. It also highlights strategies for directing future growth to safer areas, for example, through transfer of development rights programs. Finally, approaches such as strengthening existing development in hazardous areas through building codes are also detailed. 
A National Institute of Building Sciences report demonstrated that for every $1 invested in, in mitigation, there is a $4 return in future losses avoided. Resiliency expands the notion of economic return on investment to also include the environmental and social losses avoided. For communities that have experienced disasters, you know these multiple impacts all too well and want to do everything within your power to reduce these in the future. This guide also takes community context into consideration. There is not a one-size-fits-all solution for every community. For example, small towns with no planning staff may be challenged to implement a planning tool that requires high technical, administrative, and financial capacity. And let's not forget the challenge that every community faces, building community goals and political will to take action to ensure safe development. The guide also considers the interrelatedness of multiple hazards. Many Colorado communities have experienced this firsthand. For example, the 2002 drought and wildfires and the resulting chronic debris flows and post-wildfire floods caused by the Hayman Fire. The cascading impacts of drought, fire, floods, debris flows, and soil hazards have serious consequences when interfacing with the built environment. Looking forward, the Colorado Climate Plan points to rising temperatures that will exacerbate drought conditions through faster and earlier snow melts and more frequent periods of extreme weather. Water and conservation planning are critical considerations for development in the West. Additionally, you know that it's important to come together and kind of break down the silos so that um, planners and land emergency managers and kind of all the stakeholders in the community are working together towards solutions in a collaborative approach. Now we're going to um, turn this over to Tarek Wafai from Clarion <coughs> to provide an overview of the planning guide and the website. Thanks very much, Anne, and hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I wanted to talk about the document and the website that we're very proud of, built on the foundation that Ann just described, starting with the main goals of the project. So we wanted to make sure that this project didn't just communicate to land use planners, although many of the tools that we profile in this guide are really uh, built for land use planners, we want to make sure that we're communicating to multiple audiences. It's not just the emergency managers that we want to reach. It's not just the land use planners. It's the Parks and Recreation Department. It's the Public Works Division. It's elected officials. It's students. It's everybody that will give us a, a far reach for the subject matter. And so again, like I've mentioned, we have a printed guide and a website. Um, and I'm going to walk you through both of those in the next section. So here's a, a brief outline of what the printed guide looks like. There's an introduction and summary and planning framework. That really brings you through the premise that Ann just described, talking about why this is important to Coloradans, why this is something that land use planners and emergency managers should be thinking about. The first two really set the stage. It's that third bullet point, the hazard identification and risk assessment. That's where it talks about um, the FEMA process for identifying those hazards. It talks about identifying vulnerable populations. But the fourth bullet, planning tools and strategies, this is really the bulk of the project, the bulk of the website, the bulk of the printed guide. I would say it makes up at least two-thirds of the document itself. And we've identified several planning tools, which I'll walk through a few um, in a moment. Moving forward, uh, that chapter describes how do we put these tools to action? How would I use some of these things in my community? What if I'm a small community? What are some of the data sources that I can look to um, for implementing these planning tools and strategies? And then finally, the appendix are very uh, detailed descriptions of each hazard that was profiled in the guide. There's a description of each hazard. Um, we talk about where these hazards occur in Colorado, uh, what are the related hazards to that particular instance, and again, data sources applicable to those types of hazards. So here is the hazards lineup. Um, you'll see we've profiled 11 different hazards in this guide. That does not mean that there are not other hazards that impact Colorado. Uh, but based on the, so the scope and size of this project, 
this is a starting point for this. Uh, we've left out grasshopper infestation, bioterrorism, civil disobedience, volcanoes. There are other things out there that may be applicable as this website and, and document gets updated over time. But this was a good place for us to start. Here's just a quick look at the 25 planning tools uh, that we do identify in the guide. Um, 25 in six different categories. There's addressing hazards in, places, in plans and policies. There's strengthening incentives, providing, uh, protecting sensitive areas, improving site development standards, improving buildings and infrastructure, and then enhancing administration and procedures. These six categories were the ones that came up uh, through our advisory committee, and we decided that was a good point for us to, to start referencing and finding planning tools that can fit within those categories, and I'm going to walk you through a few of those. But what is in each one of these planning tool profiles? We start with how the, the planning tool works. What does it take to get one of these um, implemented? And where has it been done in Colorado? Are there certain communities that have used this tool effectively? Are they small communities? Are they large communities? What are some of the advantages and key talking points to help you address your appointed and elected officials? And more importantly, what are some of the challenges that Colorado communities have faced? So for nearly half of the tools, we also include model code language and commentary. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the coming slides. But this was a really key feature to the project for implementation. You can learn about the planning tool, but then we have provided some actual code language that you can tailor to your community. So here's what one of the profiles looks like in the printed version of the guide. In this case, we're, we're profiling subdivision and site design standards. Uh, you'll see the icons carried through there. This tells you that, hey, this is a good planning tool, not just for wildfire, but also for avalanches and extreme heat and flood. So how can we use these, this tool for those hazards? Uh, we talk about how it works. We talk about how you would implement this through land use ordinances. And then we mentioned that it's been done in Pagosa Springs. It's been done in many communities. Then moving on, in each profile, we have a set of key facts. That's an important little table that identifies what does it take to adopt something like this? Do I need um, high technical capability to be able to create an ordinance? Uh, is there a mapping necessary of the, with this type of a tool? Are there statutory requirements that have to be met? And finally, what, what types of costs are associated with each one of these tools? And then we lead into the examples. You'll see in this particular one, uh, we have seven or eight counties and cities across the state, um, even one from Washington, uh, to really give a, a broader reaching number of examples for this tool. So back to the model code. Here's a list of all of the planning tools that were profiled in the guide. And the highlighted and pink ones are the ones where model code language is provided. And in the printed version of the guide, this is what the model looks like. Highlighted in blue is actual code or ordinance language that could be tailored by the land use planner, by the attorney, um, by anyone looking to adopt something like this. So that's what those arrows are pointing to. The arrow on the far right column identifies commentary that helps explain that code language. So let's take cluster subdivision, for instance. In the applicability standards, where do cluster subdivisions apply? Is it all properties? Is it just a certain number of zoning districts? Here's some model language that you can tailor. And then the commentary might tell you that, hey, this does not have to be a mandatory tool. It could also be optional. Um, remember to consider mapping these hazard areas if you're going to require clustering in certain cases. And for the examples in this case, um, I just wanted to show the breadth of examples that we've included. So you'll see here we've got a southwestern Colorado county. We have a big city in Aurora 
small town, Durango, Front Range, we've got Longmont, uh, Route County, Summit County, we've got the resort counties covered. So we try to be very mindful in this project to be able to capture the various different community contexts. And again, in the appendix, this is where you would go to find out, well, what is mud and debris flow anyhow? And how does it impact Colorado? And what types of data sources could I explore to find out if this hazard might impact my community? So shifting gears a little bit, we're going to move on. That is the printed guide. I want to now focus on the website uh, that will be maintained over time. And that website is planningforhazards.com. And some of the goals of the website, we developed these user profiles to say, you know, maybe Janelle is a college student and she's looking to learn more about a particular planning tool. Maybe she wants to learn about one or two hazards. Jim, he's a trained land use planner. Maybe he has 20 or 30 years experience. He wants to know what new tools are being used for hazard mitigation purposes. These might be tools that he's used for other reasons in the past, but wants to draw those new connections. And then finally, Gina, she's an elected official. How might she explore the website just to get a, a 30,000 foot view of why the land use planner is suggesting even using some of these tools? But it's a dynamic website. It will change over time. And the plan is to build on, on what is there today um, as new tools are developed as older tools are modified uh, for hazard mitigation purposes. Let's take Jim's scenario. He's the land use planner. He has some questions about wildfire. So how does wildfire impact other Colorado communities? What kinds of mitigation tools are people using in the planning realm to address wildfire risk? And then what other hazards could also be addressed with that same planning tool? So some pretty big questions that the website can help him at answer. So he would go to the home page of the website, and down at the bottom of that page, he would see this list of hazard icons. He could simply click on the wildfire button, and that would bring him to the wildfire page. And you'll notice there's a, a description of wildfires in Colorado. There's a description of the hazard itself up above this screenshot. Um, and then along the right-hand side is a list of those tools in their applicable tool categories that he might want to learn more about. Maybe these are tools that would work for Jim's community. So he might click, hey, overlay zoning, that's something I'm familiar with. Let's see how that could be applied to address wildfire risk. And then he would simply click on that tool. Now at this point, we know the attention span of most people. That when there are multiple things to click on, there are several different directions that you might go in. You might look at where, where has overlay zoning been used in Colorado? He sees here that there's model and commentary for overlay zoning, so he might go in that direction. Or he might become distracted and say, well, I've lost interest in wildfire for the next 30 seconds, so I'm going to click on landslide. So we want to give you just a quick demonstration of the website live. And we've got that pulled up. Okay, so from the home page, there are several different things that you can do. You can read the guide by chapter. Um, you could go to a hazard-specific topic of interest. You could explore a, a, a certain tool that you've heard about and, and want to know how that could be applied to hazard mitigation. Or you can actually download the guide from this website. So I just want to walk through a few of those. You'll notice at the top, we've got this uh, handy bar that links you to most everything on the entire website. So let's pretend I'm Jim again and I want to learn about wildfire. Um, I can click here at the top and go down to wildfire. If I want to learn about specific tools, there's our tool categories. And if I hover above them, they will show me each of the tools within that category. And then I would click on a specific one to go there. So let's take the wildfire example. I can go from there. Or, I'm, in this case, I'm going to scroll down the page and actually click on that tool. Now I'm in the wildfire page. And from here, 
I still have access to the entire website using this top navigation bar. But let's say that I was interested in a specific tool. Let's choose transfer of development rights just for fun. And that has brought me to that specific tool page of which I can get to the models and commentary or anywhere else that I'm interested in at that point. I'm going to bring us back to the home page quickly and show you how to download the guide. So you can download the entire guide using this handy button on the home page. Or if you go to resources and click documents, you can filter by category. So select either the entire guide, you can select by chapter, um, you can select by hazard and get to the various different pieces that you might be interested in and that will get you to a PDF that has been preloaded into the website and you can either view or download those. So I encourage you all to go to planningforhazards.com and start reviewing the website. Give us your feedback. Um, again, this is something that will be maintained over time, so we're interested in, in progressing from here. So back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so I want to just walk through a couple of different Colorado examples of the tools that were included in the guide, um, and then we'll get into a video portion. Eagle County uh, uses a site-specific hazard assessment tool that has been profiled in the guide. Several communities use this tool, but theirs is very unique. They started it actually before the Hayman fire occurred in Colorado, and if you're not aware of that, there was an enormous hundreds of thousands of acres burned in Colorado in 2002, um, Eagle County had started thinking about how can we address wildfire risk at the subdivision scale, at the, at the PUD scale. If we're doing special use permit review, how can we put wildfire mitigation into the forefront? So Eric Lovgren, he's a wildfire mitigation manager up in Eagle County, he literally gets in his truck and will go to a site and review the site with the developer, with the homeowner, to talk about how wildfire uh, mitigation can be implemented on that project. Some of the challenges that they've had is that the public really had a tough time accepting this new level of review. Um, there were private property rights advocates who said, this is really none of your business, which trees I keep, which trees I cut down. Um, another challenge was that there was a lot of second home ownership in Eagle County, so how could Eric as a mitigation planner reach those owners and notify them that there was an issue? Um, paying for the program has also been an issue for Eagle County. They only charge $200 to go out on a site visit uh, for each subdivision or PUD, and that does not cover the cost for Eric's time or driving the truck out there, but they have not at this point in time pursued raising the fee. Some of the advantages for this specific tool is it's really boots on the ground uh, gives them those planners the ability to identify specific hazards, whether it's a grouping of trees, whether it's debris under a planned deck area, uh, whether there's a potential to cluster development on a larger site, um, or identify any other hazardous conditions that might be out there. One other Colorado example um, under subdivision and site design standards is the town of Pagosa Springs down in southwestern Colorado. Um, they have sensitive area protection standards in their land use and development code. And they address a, a variety of different land use or natural hazards, um, steep slopes, flood hazards, geologic hazards, wildfire areas. And they also uh, address other issues too that are non-hazard related like wildlife migration. So one example from their code is how does subdivision in a geologic hazard area take place? They look at uh, specific criteria, making sure that it does not create undue financial burden on future residents. If I'm building in a geologic hazard area, um, if a rock slide were to occur, that's an undue financial burden on the purchaser of that property. Are structures designed for occupancy 
or are these simply um, outbuildings or sheds that will not be at risk of human life? And what types of permitted uses should really be avoiding geologic hazards? Probably large congregations of, of people, um, you know, higher density residential uses. Those are things that you want to pay extra special attention to concerning geologic hazards. And they do that through their subdivision review procedures. So we wanted to take a few minutes and show you a, a maybe half of a clip from Jim Crenute up in Summit County who told us about his TDR program and how that works for wildfire. Um, we're going to switch over to the video portion and then Ann Miller will go back and, and talk about next steps moving forward for implementing some of the tools that, that are covered in the guide. Um, this is a really cool feature of the website because we've, we've used this enriched media content to include videos from planners all over the state. So we're going to play this short clip for you. Most of Summit County is located in a high alpine environment, so we have uh, a lot of natural hazards to contend with. We've got um, wildfire hazards. You know, about 80% of Summit County is national forest land. So, unfortunately, we were hit with the pine beetle epidemic a number of years ago. So we have a lot of uh, standing and down dead timber throughout all of Summit County. So wildfire hazards. We have a lot of geologic hazards: rockfall, landslides, debris flows, mud flows. Uh, avalanche shoots to contend with, uh, and also, you know, due to our high snowpack, we've got a lot of uh, high runoff uh, in our uh, rivers and streams in the springtime. Really taking a hard look of where development activities occur and trying to steer those uh, actions toward places that are less susceptible to hazard. The idea behind transferring your development rights is to is is providing an opportunity for property owners to as an option to developing in the, in the location where their property is located to have uh, the opportunity possibly to sell their development right or move their development right to a, a, a property that is more appropriate for development. It allows that development right, whether it's a home or, or a certain amount of density related to commercial, to be put in a place that's less susceptible to natural hazard risk. We have an intergovernmental agreement with the Breckenridge and uh, they're happy to participate in that program because the end result is that uh, development does not occur on those steep hillsides around their town, kind of in their backcountry, in their playground, in their backyard, and it allows uh, that density to get moved down right into the town. So per our program, density goes from the unincorporated Summit County right into the town of Breckenridge, uh, which is probably our largest receiving area for density. First, establish your reasoning behind your TDR program. Uh, understand, is it to protect the character of, the, of your area that you're trying to preserve, or is it to indeed get density out of areas subject to natural hazards? And so first you would want to you know, establish your, your scope, uh, your real focus for the program. And then um, you know, it's just a matter of looking around at other programs out there in the state. In Summit County, we looked at Aspen Picking County and Boulder County. They both have excellent TDR programs. And uh, we also actually looked nationwide. And with, uh, with all those examples, we just customized our program to meet our needs locally. We formed a local uh, advisory committee made up of planning commissioners and town council members and board members and uh, interested citizens. And through that committee, we were able to uh, form the, the TDR regulations that we have today. Our TDR program is geared toward protection of the character of our backcountry areas. So by not having that density out there in the hillsides with their long driveways and the house up on the side of the hill, the lights, the noise, the impacts on the, on the environment, uh, we're able to you know, uh, move that density to more appropriate urban locations. And so it lessens uh, the number of calls to fire departments to go off into the hinterlands and, and try and find where the problem is. Um, and it just
keeps uh, the, our backcountry character uh, the way it's been for hundreds of years. We've protected probably uh, about 1,200 acres of land just through our TDR program. We also have a very aggressive open space purchasing program. So between the two, we're, we've been able to uh, prevent hundreds of units of density that would have otherwise been built in these hazard-prone hazard areas and really reduce the risk to our, our population. All right, thanks everybody. We'll go back to our PowerPoint slides. Um, now might be a good time also as we're about to wrap up the presentation to start typing in your questions. So you saw from the, um, Jim's example that uh, some action that Summit County is taking to reduce risk through land use planning. And this guide is packed full of all kinds of great examples from across the state and in some cases the country of where these different planning strategies have been used and implemented. So the whole point of this guide and the website is to empower local governments here in Colorado to use this as a jumping off place to take the next steps and take a look at their own plan, your own plans and your strategies to see if you can improve it to, so that you won't be one of those communities that in the future, who knows, suffers from some kind of disaster and that you'll be ready and do everything within your power to reduce that risk. So we invite local governments to put this guide into action and start by integrating hazards into your comprehensive plan and partnering with emergency managers and the other stakeholders and with internally and externally and your community. Help us get the word out about the guide and website to educate your staff, your planning commissioners, your elected fish officials, and community members on how your community can take action. So choosing appropriate planning tools. This guide sets it up so that you understand your risks, you plan for them, and you act on them. So take an assessment of where your community is at now. Do you have solid data, and do you really understand the hazard risks in your community? If not, consider conducting a hazard identification and risk assessment, teaming up with your emergency management staff, including assessing vulnerable populations. Also, in your next comprehensive plan update, use hazard data and, and hazard data and maps to strategically um, plan for and make sure you've got goals and policies in these plans to support strong land use tools to reduce your risk. And also to really look at promoting multiple objectives, such as open space preservation and flood protection. Build a case for action through engagement of internal and exter external stakeholders, including elected officials that are key to making decisions in your community. Do the research and build that community vision around those multiple benefits that can be achieved and ground this in your plans and policies and create that unified message to rally around. The city of Longmont, Colorado did a great job of consistent messaging to create community awareness and support for important flood recovery efforts that are currently still underway. Also, don't work in isolation. Bring your community experts and stakeholders along. Uh, look for examples of the best practices um, next door and across the state and country um, and where different strategies have been implemented and have worked and harness that political leadership as well as other local champions. So going forward, um, we're excited to be teaming up with the University of Colorado Denver, um, and they will be maintaining this website over time. It is, as Tark mentioned, dynamic, interactive tool, um, and we encourage you to provide us with additional examples of stuff that you're doing in your community, and give us feedback on what you'd like to see added in the future. Uh, we also will be initiating an implementation program with two pilot communities that were impacted by the 2012 and 13 disasters. And um, to take 
So take a community who has the readiness to really take that action and take the next step in planning and implementation of some of these land use planning strategies. So um, we will be um, making an announcement about that program in the next month, so stay tuned on the website. And um, you may be interested in taking advantage of this program where we basically will work, walk you through the planning steps, get a, a team together um, of internal stakeholders with some, um, some other experts to go from A to Z and pick a couple strategies that you have the readiness to actually implement through either creating a program or making um, some changes in your land use codes, for example, to, to do some things differently and strengthen your planning efforts. Um, there will be some outcomes of those that pilot program that will benefit all com communities and workbooks, so uh, more information to come on that. Additional best practices and ideas that you have can be submitted to um, the email address here provided um, from Andrew Rumbach who is with us in the room right now. So this is a great time. We're going to segue into um, any questions that you might have typed in. And um, we thank you for listening to the presentation. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Anne. So Andrew Parker asked if there's any specific recommendations for hazard mitigation and the transportation network. It's a good question, Andrew. Um, you know, there's been a, a huge connection in recent years between land use and transportation. And one of the primary recommendations is that as you are updating your comprehensive plan or transportation master plan, to make sure that the right people are in the room at the same time um, so that those policies and implementation strategies are crafted together. Um, that is also the case for hazard mitigation. Um, one of the recommendations that was made in the guide is under the comprehensive plan section or the comprehensive plan tool. And for transportation uh, related to hazard mitigation, it really can be about providing adequate uh, emergency connections between and through subdivisions, um, not just from a wildfire perspective, but um, also when rock slides happen. You know, recently in Glenwood Canyon, we saw the devastating impact that that had on the overall transportation network. Um, many of you on the phone may have been stuck on either side of that canyon uh, for a number of days. So that is one thing to do. Um, also ensuring that road layouts and connections support response requirements for emergency services. So if a fire or a flood occurs, how are the emergency responders able to access those subdivisions or vulnerable populations? Um, those are a couple off the top of my head. Anne, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think going back to multiple objectives so that there's integrated planning between um, transportation planners and um, kind of utility infrastructure planning, for one, so that those are all coordinated and very strategic to um, reduce, you know, natural hazards and risks to natural hazards. Also, um, you know, looking at um, trails and the, a, lot, a lot of times run along some of our, um, in some cases, river corridors, multiple objectives. Okay. Good. Great. So RM Edwards asked, will the presentation be archived for future viewing? Yes, it will. We will post this on the planningforhazards.com website. Great. So are there any other questions? Please feel free to type them into the chat box. All right. So James Littlefield asks, can you elaborate on the involvement and commitment from the U.S. Forest Service? Many of us have a great deal of USFS land on our communities, and our wild mitigation is desperately needed on Forest Service land. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I can tell you that we did have participation on our entry committee from someone from actually the, the State Forest Service. I think we probably did not have as strong of connection to that federal agency in this, in this effort. Um, so Tark, do you have anything 
more to say, I think there's a lot of collaboration going on around wildfire protection plans, state and federal, local. Yeah, that's right. It's a very good question and one that we run into. I work with a lot of communities and uh, resort communities in western Colorado uh, that are having a, a big issue. Property owners are saying, what's the point in mitigating my property if there's not going to be adequate mitigation on the other side of the fence? And that really works both ways. So our hope is that, you know, we won't solve the federal versus private land ownership issues through this guide. What we will do is talk about some advantages and benefits for each of these planning tools and strategies. I think there are several points made throughout this guide in sidebars or in narrative that talk about the need to collaborate with those agencies. When we're talking about flood, is the Corps of Engineers in the room as you're making land use decisions, um, as you're deciding where future growth should occur? Is the Federal Forest Service, is the State Forest Service involved with reviewing unique subdivisions where you think um, mitigation might be an issue or might be necessary to mitigate the risk? Um, that's about all I can say. I mean, the guy did um, commit to collaborating with folks with FEMA and the State Forest Service, but um, again, I think that's a good opportunity for maybe, maybe elaborating on through the next update. Thanks for your question, James. Okay, well, it looks like um, we have no more questions. Um, we'll wait a second. We want to thank everybody for tuning in here today and encourage you, invite you to go explore the website and apply that to taking action in your community. Our contact information is here on the slide. We also encourage you, again, to um, provide your ideas and input um, on the planningforhazards.com website. And we look forward to seeing great things happen in Colorado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.